Well, it's always a joy to join you, and thank you once again for hosting another Peter Tatchell, GAR, or LGBT Humanist lecture. Um, as you know, the topic of tonight's uh, talk is what should schools teach pupils about sex? You'll probably be aware that earlier this year, a committee of MPs in Parliament considered this issue and came up with recommendations including that sex and relationship education should be mandatory in every school and that it should be inclusive of LGBTI issues. So that was great. The only problem is the government has ignored the recommendations, even though there was a very strong, solid, conservative bloc on that committee who did recommend these important reforms. So we're in a situation where the Committee of MPs has spoken, said the right things, but we have yet to get the government to implement them. So there is an ongoing campaign pioneered by the Sex Education Forum, which is a coalition of organizations connected with sexual health, children's welfare, and so on, that is pushing this campaign. So I'd urge you to check out the Sex Education Forum. And my starting point tonight is that we know that millions of people enter adulthood sexually and emotionally illiterate. They may have done well in maths, English, science, and so on, but when it comes to sex and relationships, so many young people leave school unprepared for what will surely be one of the most important aspects of their lives the person they love and have a relationship with. And the end result is, of course, um, many of those people go on to subsequently endure disordered, unhappy relationships, <coughs> ranging from merely unfulfilling to downright abusive. Uh, the consequence for millions of people is much unhappiness and sometimes actual physical and mental ill health because they have not received the important life-affirming sex and relationship education to enable them to have happy, healthy sex lives and to have emotional fulfillment and satisfaction with their partners. So to me, the lack of adequate, effective sex and relationship education in this country is part of the problem. Um, we know it does exist, but it's in most schools irregular, vague, and euphemistic. It teaches kids a lot about the reproductive cycle. It teaches kids about guinea pigs and rabbits and other species, but not actually much about human sexuality. Um, and the end result is, of course, that the absence of explicitness, honesty, upfront information means that the practical benefit of that sex and relationship education is very limited. And we know this from the surveys of young people themselves, who have said time and time again they didn't feel that sex and relationship education was adequate, that they didn't learn enough, that it was too uh, vague, too general, too nonspecific, and in particular, they say time and time again that the emotional side of sex and relationship education is often ignored or given scant attention. And the emotional side is, of course, very, very crucial to people's health and happiness. Um, so the end, end result of all these different surveys is that um, young people are saying there's very little teaching in schools about sex or indeed relationships. Having said that, there are some schools that are doing great work, but they're a very, very small minority. And there are some uh, external bodies that go into schools and do great work addressing these issues, but by and large, they are not representative. Um, the other complaint we have from young people is that so often, sex and relationship education starts too late, often after they've begun 
their first sexual experiences. So when they had those first experiences, they didn't have even the limited information that they were subsequently given. Now, my view is that if you want to protect young people's health, for example, safer sex to protect against HIV and other sexually transmitted infections, plus the risk of unwanted pregnancies and abortions, um, you have to start this education early, before young people slip into bad habits. If young people are aware of the responsible, healthy way to behave from an early age, when they begin their sexual lives, there's no guarantee they'll do it, but they're more likely to do it. Um, I have to cautionary add that while sex and relationship education shouldn't encourage young people to have sex at an early age, I think the consensus is that amongst both educators and young people themselves that it's best if they delay first sexual experiences until they're fully physically and emotionally prepared. So I don't want to encourage early sex, but if they're going to have sex, at least they ought to be prepared. If they're going to have a relationship, at least they should have the basic information about how to make that relationship work and to deal with the kinds of ups and downs that relationships inevitably involve. Um, you may know that the government's education watchdog, Ofsted, some years ago did an investigation and said that the amount of time spent on sex and relationship education in schools was woefully inadequate, and that much of it is of very poor quality. Partly because, of course, teachers are not given training in how to do sex and relationship education. They get training in history, physics, English, mathematics, but not in the delivery of sex and relationship education, unless they go on a special course run by the Sex Education Forum, which is doing great work, but so far has only, I think, reached a few hundred teachers out of the tens of thousands around the country. Um, the Social Exclusion Unit noted, and I quote, the universal message received from young people is that sex and relationship education they receive falls far short of what they would like. So this begs the question, what needs to change in order to make sex and relationship education more effective, more relevant, and appropriate to young people's needs and requests. So what I want to do tonight is give you a few suggestions, some few bullet points about what good sex and relationship education might involve. For me, the first principle is the recognition that sexual rights are human rights. Um, human rights are not just about the right to protest or freedom of speech. They're also about the right of sexual self-determination, the right of any adult person to love another adult person of either sex or both sexes and to engage in any mutually consensual, harmless sexual act with them and consequently to share a happy, healthy sex life. I think those are human rights. As I said, love and relationships are two of the most important things in most people's lives. It is a human right that they're able to enjoy those lives and have sexual and emotional fulfillment. That brings me to the second point, which is, as I mentioned, the right to sexual self-determination. I'd like to see every school promote the message, it's my body and it's my right to control it. Um, the idea is to ensure that young people assert their right, what they and others do with their body, including the right to abstain from sex, to say no, and to report abusers. The right to be LGBT or straight that's a really fundamental issue of sexual self-determination and gender identity self-determination. And I think that this ethos of young people be
being able to assert their right to control what is done to their body by themselves and others, that is very, very fundamental. Um, the ethos of sexual self-determination is crucial in order to thwart people who attempt to pressure youngsters into abusive relationships and risky sex. And although much of the focus is on older people exploiting younger people, there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer pressure and exploitation as well. So we need to challenge that with this ethos of it's my body and sexual self-determination. Um, many people have pondered over the issue of the ethical framework. And I really think it's quite simple. The ethical framework that I think ought to be taught in schools is the principle of mutual consent, respect, and fulfillment. If you stand by those core three elements, I don't think you can go far wrong. Um, I think it's very important that sex and relationship education acknowledges diverse sexualities, gender identities, and lifestyles, while also giving young, young people and teenagers guidance on their rights and responsibilities, including teaching about issues of consent. You know, what constitutes consent? You know, when is a relationship consensual, when is it not? You know, just because someone doesn't say no in certain circumstances may not mean that they're actually consenting. And I think some of you may have seen the, the recent film produced for young people which explored this issue and uh, the particular case of one young man who had sex with his girlfriend while she was partially asleep. Um, she didn't say no, but it quite clearly she was not fully conscious and aware of what was going on, at least initially. Um, so those are really important issues. And the other element, of course, is that although we have great concern now, and quite rightly, about sexual abuse, whether it be adult to adult or adult to child, that's a, those are very legitimate and very disturbing elements. Uh, what is really astonishing is that sex abuse issues are not discussed in most schools. You know, some schools will say, oh, phone child line. But they don't actually teach and empower young people to take a positive stand against unwanted sex, whether it be from someone their own age or someone older. So as I said, to me, the basic ethical framework can be summed up in those three ethical principles, mutual consent, reciprocal respect, and shared fulfillment. Um, the great advantage of these principles is that they apply universally, regardless of whether people are married or single, monogamous or promiscuous, hetero, homo, bi, trans, or intersex. Those principles apply to everyone. And they're really simple, really easy to remember. Another important element, I think, is the promotion of safer alternatives to sex, such as oral sex, and mutual masturbation. Um, I think if schools are serious about cutting the incidence of teenage pregnancies and abortions and HIV infections and other sexually transmitted diseases, they ought to at least highlight the fact that there are alternatives to intercourse. That intercourse, vaginal or anal, is not the be all end all of sex. That you can have great sex without that kind of risky or potentially risky behavior. Um, we know that oral sex and mutual masturbation carry no risk of conception. So no unwanted pregnancies, no need for unwanted abortions. And of course, they also carry a much, much lower risk of HIV and some other sexually transmitted infections. Now, to me, just telling people about these alternatives is not enough. Um, some of you may have seen the book I wrote in the 1990s called Safer Sexy, The Guide to Gay Sex Safely, which was a glossy coffee table type book which had lots and lots of explicit sexual imagery. And the purpose and intention was to make safe sex look and feel glamorous. So it was appealing rather than boring, attractive rather than restrictive. And I think that's what schools need to also do 
to present images and information about how exciting and fulfilling alternatives to intercourse can be. Um, emphasizing their advantages over intercourse and stressing the fact that they carry no risk of unwanted pregnancies and reduced HIV risk. And of course, no need to use the pill or condoms. Um, while mutual masturbation is pretty much totally safe, uh, oral sex, of course, can transmit sexual infections. So it is safer than sexual intercourse, but not entirely risk-free. And that message also, of course, needs to be sent out to kids as well. Uh, another thing I'd say is that schools ought to positively say that sex is good for you. Um, sex and relationship education ought to acknowledge that sex is good for us. Um, it's natural, wholesome, fun, and with safe sex, it's healthy. Um, we know that good quality sex, particularly backed up by you know, a loving, supportive relationship, can greatly enhance people's physical and mental well-being. That if you're stressed out, um, if you're frustrated about your job and you have great sex, um, it doesn't solve the problem at work, or, but certainly it, it gives you a distraction. It, 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 it provides an, a, a diversion. And you know, it's good exercise. Sex is very good exercise. Um, it, young people have a right to know that um, while sex is not essential for health and happiness, some people get by without it, and that's fine. Um, most people find that regular, fulfilling sex lifts their spirits, enhances their lives, and their relationships. Another principle, give young people all the facts. Um, sex and relationship education ought to tell the whole truth about all different kinds of sex and relationships, including sexual practices that some people may find distasteful, such as anal intercourse and sadomasochism. Um, the purpose of detailing these other images and other practices is not to encourage them, although they shouldn't necessarily be discouraged either, provided they're consensual between adults and without harm. But the purpose is to ensure that if young people encounter them in their lives, perhaps not when they're young, but later on, that they will understand them and be able to deal with it. And they won't be so afraid and intimidated. They can still say no, but they won't have this, perhaps the shock factor and the um, you know, fear that they might have if they were uninformed. Another principle is that heterosexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality, transgenderism, and so on, these are all valid, equally valid, expressions of sex and relationships. Uh, when they're based on mutual consent, respect, and fulfillment between adults, both opposite sex and same-sex relations are equally morally valid. That's a message that needs to get out in sex and relationship educations to inform and infirm to young LGBTI kids that their feelings are valid and to make sure that straight kids understand. That they understand that some people have different preferences, different orientations to their own. So of course, while no school should promote any particular sexual orientation, they should encourage understanding, knowledge, and acceptance of heterosexual, homosexual, and bisexual orientations, and of course, of transgender and intersex identities. And that's in order to ensure people's self-acceptance, because some of them will be LGBTI, um, and also combat prejudice, discrimination, bullying, and hate crime. If young people understand the diverse sexualities and gender identities, they're much less likely to be prejudiced in later life. And then controversially, I think um, schools need to teach young people about how to have good sex. You know, sex and relationship education ought to be actually about sex and relationships. 
in order to give young people the knowledge so that they can have sexual fulfillment. Um, to me, <coughs> sexual literacy is just as important as literacy in words and numbers. Yep. Good sex isn't always obvious. It has to be learned, like every other aspect of the school curriculum. So to ensure happier, more fulfilled relationships in adulthood, sex and relationship education for pupils aged 16 and over ought to include advice on how to achieve mutually fulfilling high quality sex, including the emotional and erotic value of foreplay. Most young kids don't automatically know about erogenous zones. Young boys have a marginal knowledge about the clitoris. Um, a lot of young gay and bisexual men are very fearful of anal sex and don't know how to do it properly. Um, these things ought to be taught for the sake of people's sexual and emotional happiness, for the sake of their health. Um, I'm sure many gay men will tell stories of when they were first screwed and how painful it was. Well, that's obviously because the person doing it wasn't doing it right. Uh, and kids need to be taught how to do it right and be told about the joy of anal sex. I mean, the prostate gland is the secret male sex gland, which is why it is so pleasurable if the person doing it to you knows how to do it properly. Um, so the multitude of erogenous zones uh, and how to excite them, how to achieve good orgasms, deep breathing, muscle contractions, all those things ought to be taught. Not because you're seeking to sexualize young people. By the age of 16, most of them have already had their first sexual experience of some sort. The purpose is to make them able to have a happy fulfilled one, and very importantly, to make sure their partners have a happy and fulfilled one. If they don't understand their own bodies, how can they understand the bodies of their partners? How can they understand the value and importance of erotic foreplay and so on? Then there's live and let live. Human sexuality embraces a glorious diversity of emotions and desires. We're all unique with our own individual erotic tastes. People are sexually fulfilled in a huge variety of different ways. And providing it's between adults with consent and mutual respect and fulfillment, that's fine. Whatever turns you on. Uh, providing, as I said, behavior is consensual, no one's harmed, it's between adults, the enjoyment is reciprocal, schools should adopt a non-judgmental live and let live attitude. Emphasize the mutual consent, respect and fulfillment, but beyond that, don't take moral judgments about different types of sex and different types of pleasure. I also think that sex and relationship education ought to begin from the very first year of primary school. Of course, it needs to be age appropriate. I think at the first year of primary school, you don't talk about sex, but you talk about relationships, you talk about love, that love can be between a man and a woman, or between two men or two women, or between you know, a person who's trans and a person who's straight, a person who's intersex and a person who's gay. Lots of different options. And I think young people understand that basics of love. And where this kind of teaching has been trialed, young people get it. My neighbor's daughter, uh, was on, uh, was watching TV the other day, and she saw two men kissing, and she said, oh, I've heard about that. Isn't that lovely? Isn't that sweet? I don't know where she heard about it, but <laughs> it was good that she knew, and she wasn't shocked, and even better that she thought it was sweet. So I think that in these first years of primary school, talking about love and diverse families and diverse relationships, that some kids will have two mummies or two daddies, that's really positive because that makes those kids in the school who have two mummies and two daddies feel affirmed and valued and recognized and helps break down the prejudice, I hope, of other kids as well. Um, 
It's also very important that in primary school, teachers start talking about the changes that will happen in young people's bodies at the age of puberty, which now can range between the age of eight to 12. Young people are approaching puberty or experiencing puberty at an increasingly younger age. So by the age of eight, which is about the earliest age that most kids experience puberty, they need to know. So they're not afraid of body changes like pubic hair and, uh, in the case of girls, menstruation and so on. Um, also, of course, those young people need to know what is appropriate and you know, to be taught about appropriate and inappropriate touching. Um, then, of course, at secondary level, it can become more explicit, more detailed, more upfront. Now, the reason for starting so young, again, is not to encourage young people to have sex, but to ensure that they know about the physical changes that will take place in their bodies and the desires that will develop. So it's amazing to this day how many young girls, when they first menstruate, have this fear of terror because no one explained it properly. Some young boys get very uh, frightened when they get their first erection because no one's told them. Now, that's a fairly small minority these days, but the fact that any child goes through that is quite clearly a social failing. If we keep young people ignorant, that jeopardizes their future happiness, health, and welfare. To me, early knowledge is the key to um, wise, responsible behavior in later life. If people know and understand the changes their bodies will take, if they know and understand their rights and responsibilities, if they understand <coughs> sex and emotions fully, they're much more likely to make wise, responsible, mutually satisfying decisions in later life. Another principle is respect for sexual diversity. Um, our desires, our temperaments are not all the same. There's no one size fits all when it comes to sex, love, and relationships. And that's why it's very important that teachers have a duty to validate the diversity of adult sex and relationships that fall within the ethical framework of consent, respect, and fulfillment for both partners. Um, overcoming shame, overcoming shame about sex is really crucial to tackling abuse. Um, we know that sexual guilt causes immense human misery. You know, people who are guilty and ashamed about sex lead often very unhappy, disordered lives, very conflicted lives. Um, it's not just a case of them often having frustrated, unhappy sex lives, but actual emotional, psychological, and even sometimes physical ill health. And of course, when young people feel ashamed about sex, they're much less likely to report abuse. If they feel guilty, if they think it's some dirty, dark secret, they're much, more, much less likely to come forward if they are subject to unwanted sexual advances or touching by others, whether they be their own age or older. Um, adults who sexually exploit youngsters often get away with it because the victims feel embarrassed or guilty about sex. And that means they're reluctant to report it. So I think if sex and relationship education can encourage young people to have more open, positive attitudes towards sexual matters, teenagers are going to feel more able to uh, discuss sex abuse issues. Um, if they're feeling at ease in talking about sex, they're much more likely to disclose abuse. Another principle is mandatory lessons and a revised parental opt-out. As I mentioned, the Parliamentary Committee recommended that sex and relationship education ought to be compulsory in every school. You know, I, I second that, and again, the reason is obvious. Because sex and relationship education is about addressing a really important aspect of people's lives, of course it should be mandatory. 
Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not, not good enough to have mandatory education if it's only like once a year or once a term, which a lot of schools do. In a lot of schools, section rates of education, where it does exist, is once a term uh, or once or twice a year. That is not adequate. It needs to be um, you know, a mandatory part of the curriculum in every school, and at least monthly, if not more often, throughout a child's entire life. <coughs> Ongoing. Not just you know, in the you know, first year of secondary school and then the, the last year of secondary school, but all throughout primary and secondary education. So that young people grow up with this knowledge and empowerment, this advice, this good sense uh, about ethical ways uh, to deal with sex and relationships. Um, we know that under the current rules, parents have a right to opt out or to get their kids to opt out of sex and relationship education. And you know, a minority, a fairly small minority, but mostly of religious parents choose to take their children out of sex and relationship education classes. You know, they write a letter to the school, and the school then exempts their child from those lessons. Well, my question is, we don't allow parents to take their kids out of science or mathematics or geography or um, physics or biology. Why should they be able to take their kids out of sex and relationship education? It's part of the education curriculum. Um, so I've come up with a slightly modified version of the parental opt-out because I know that politicians are too cowardly to insist that parents should not have the right to take the kids out of classes. So what I'm suggesting is the policy ought to be modified to allow parents to take their kids out of those classes but require them to come physically to the school each lesson to physically take their child out of that class. Now, of all places, this was trialled a few years ago in Northern Ireland by a couple of schools. And the parental withdrawal rate plummeted to zero. <laughs> Parents had a view, but they were too lazy to come to the school every week or every month, whatever, to take their kids out. So that's a way around it. Um, I've outlined a few ideas. This, this isn't a comprehensive or exclusive set of ideas about how we can improve sex and relationship education, but it's perhaps a start. And I think that the Education Secretary, Nikki Morgan, really has to think hard about why her government is not agreeing to make sex and relationship education mandatory, why she's not insisting it has to be LGBTI inclusive. It's just a recommendation, it's just an encouragement that schools can and do ignore it. And why all these other issues that I've outlined tonight should not be part of the school curriculum. The responsibility is the Education Secretary to answer, why not? And I think all of us who care about young people's health and welfare and care about the welfare of adults who have not been properly prepared by the school system and therefore had unhappy, unhealthy and disordered sexual and emotional lives, if we care about that, we must push for change. Thank you. So I've very briefly got a few minutes for questions and answers or contributions. Well, it, it, it can be, and sometimes is, you know, a very useful tool. And the Sex Education Forum and others have done some work in this area, but it hasn't been properly funded. It hasn't been sustained. That's not really a criticism of them, because they're under-resourced, understaffed, and underfunded. But I certainly think that using social media can be a very important, powerful way to get these messages out in the absence of them being put out by and through schools. Well, I think schools have to get their priorities right. I think right now the priorities are not right at all. Uh, as I said, sex and relationships are two of the most important things in people's lives. For most people, their lives revolve around the person they're in love with and living with. Uh, and we need to make sure that they are able to 
achieve for themselves and their partner the maximum sexual health, happiness, and fulfillment. So I think school resources or education resources need to be made available for these issues. And the government needs to, if necessary, put in extra funding. And a very good place to start would, of course, be in explicit teacher training in this issue. Um, I'm not entirely up to speed in the last couple of years, but when I last checked a couple of years ago, um, sex and relationship education does not feature in most teacher training courses. And there is no teacher training module for how to teach sex and relationship education. There obviously is for the science subjects, mathematics, English, and so on, but not for sex and relationship education. So I think providing that training so that teachers are um, fully aware of all the issues and know how to teach the subject in an effective way, that's a vital part of the equation. Well, I think we have to try and frame it, perhaps better than I have tonight, we have to try and frame it. This is not about encouraging young people to have sex, although they should be free to both say yes and say no. Um, it is about preparing them for adult life and protecting them uh, from sexual ill health and protecting them from emotional ill health. You know, most schools, they teach young kids nowadays how to roll a condom on a banana. But they don't teach young people what to do if their partner refuses to wear a condom. So they don't teach them about alternative forms of sex. Um, they don't teach young people about um, all the different kinds of things one can do in the build-up to sex. Um, you know, the emotional side, but also you know, foreplay and erogenous zones and all those kind of things. And so most young people say their first sexual experience is pretty unsatisfactory because often it's been very rushed, um, and particularly when it's between boys and girls, it's often, you know, the girl feels very much used and the boy just wants to get his rocks off and that's it. Um, if we give young people this information, I think more young people are likely to perhaps say no to early premature sex. Um, and they're likely to have higher expectations and not put up with the kind of mistreatment that often goes on uh, between young people of similar ages, where one person is just interested in having you know, a quick sex and having an orgasm, and the other person is more interested in you know, a prolonged experience and also the emotional side. Um, we know that um, a lot of people who have experienced early and effective sex education, in fact, tend to delay their first sexual experience. So you may know that in the Netherlands, uh, until some years ago, the age of consent was in effect 12. Uh, the age of consent in the was, was in effect 12 unless parents complained or social workers complained. Um, but even at that stage, even though teenagers in the Netherlands had the right to have sex lawfully from the age of 12, providing their parents and social workers didn't object. In fact, on average, they delayed their first sexual experience longer than teenagers in Britain. So the evidence from that experience in many other countries and particular educational establishments where this information and approach has been tried is that give young people the information and in fact, they're less likely to have sex and to have much higher expectations and to put up with less kind of abuse and exploitation. Well, of course, the Sex Education Forum is very poorly funded. So it's, they've got a limited capacity. Um, there are some other organizations as well, but they do tiny, tiny work. Um, so that's the big problem. The government is not recognizing the importance and value. And of course, it shouldn't be up to the Sex Education Forum to do this teacher training. It should be done by the Department of Education and the relevant schools, universities, and teacher training colleges. Uh, so that, that's one issue. Um, the second issue is, of course, um, when it comes to teaching about sex and relationships, 
um, we need to ensure that, yeah, we educate more parents about these issues. So, as you suggest, parents won't be so up in arms and therefore politicians will feel more uh, confident. So any of you who are on school governing bodies or have kids or grandkids or relatives with kids at school, it's really important that you make sure that they make representations to the headmaster and the school governing body that you want this kind of good quality sex and relationship education because the other side who doesn't, they certainly do make representations. Um, just in terms of LGBTI issues, um, I'd recommend very strongly uh, a website called The Classroom. The kind is theclassroom.com. It's been set up by Schools Out, the LGBT schools and education body, uh, and it is a module of lessons about LGBTI issues. So teachers can go to that website and download lessons. It's not strictly about sex and relationships, it's more about LGBTI issues, but it's a really, really effective, valuable resource. I always, when I go to schools, always talk about it, and the feedback I get from teachers is, wow, that's fantastic. Because it is done by experts in the field who know how to teach these issues effectively. You download it, the teacher doesn't have to do much preparation, they just have to read it, imbibe the information, and then impart it. So if any of you are teachers or you know people who are teachers, please recommend theclassroom.com. It's an amazing, positive resource. And of course, that model could and should be used by the Department of Education to provide you know, ready-made sex and relationship education uh, lessons for teachers. In the absence of proper teacher training and so on, let the Department of Education have those lessons online you know, with different age-appropriate levels so teachers who want to teach it can download and use it. Well, of course, in some of the European countries, they do. You know, they do have sex and, rape, sex and relationship education on TV uh, in the form of adverts or programmes that are sometimes funded by government bodies. Sadly, we are too scared and timid and puritan. But that will change. That is changing. And we need to help make it change faster. I'm going to have to do the last question now. But of course, it, it all boils down to a decision by the Education Secretary and the government about what kind of resources they want to devote. And they've taken a decision that these issues are not very important. I think that's the wrong decision, and I think we need to challenge and change it. So one thing you can all do from this meeting is perhaps, you know, go and look at theclassroom.com, go and look at the Sex Education Forum uh, website. Um, and I think on there, on the Sex Education forum website, there is a standard letter you can write to your Member of Parliament. Um, I think you may be able to do it directly from the website, but if not, go to writetothem.com, writetothem.com. It will ask you to put in your postcode, and then it will tell you who your Member of Parliament is, and you can email them direct from that website. Enough people, if enough people actually make that demand, it will help embolden, I think, in time, it will help embolden more MPs to take a stand in favour of mandatory, inclusive sex and relationship education. On that note, I want to thank you all very much. Thank you.